But we welcome you all here today, and those of you that are online, thank you for joining us. Uh, we took a, a break last week from uh, the series that we're in. We had Donnie come in. Didn't Donnie Moore do a great job? We love Donnie, and, and just whenever he can be with us, we are so blessed to have him. But we are jumping back into our series, The Blessed Life, and the title of today's message is Learning to Be Content. Now, during this series, we've been answering the question, how can I live a life of generosity? How can I become a spirit-led giver? We have also learned that the Bible has much to say about money and possessions. In fact, it has more to say about money and possessions than almost any other subject. The Bible is full of money management advice. There are two books in particular in the Bible that talk about wealth and money management, and that is Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, and we're going to look over there in just a moment. Those books teach us the principle of money management, the principles of prosperity, and the principles and rules for managing wealth. But I want to say something and make something very clear here today. We are not a prosperity gospel church. The idea of giving so that I can get, I believe, creates a self-centered focus, and I don't believe that God wants our giving to be focused on ourselves. So the idea is I'm giving so that God can simply give me more. I don't believe in that at all. I believe this. I believe God wants me to give And whatever he chooses to do from there, thank you, Lord, for it. But I am satisfied with just being obedient. And if I was obedient to give, and that's all I did, knowing I did it in the name of the Lord, hallelujah, I am a blessed man. But there are blessings that do come. But it is not my reason or motive for joining the Lord in his work. I just do it because God wants me to do it. And I don't believe also that God wants everyone to be a millionaire. I believe, in fact, the Bible teaches the exact opposite. We learned a few weeks ago about the talents that were given, and it said each according to his ability. How many of you know we all have different gifts, different abilities? The Bible, I want you to know, is filled with principles that say this. Here's what I do know. If you will do this in managing your wealth, in managing your finances, there will be blessings that are going to come into your life. And the principle we're going to study today is an absolute priority. If you don't get this first principle down, the next two weeks won't matter. You need to get this one down first. And today we are looking into learning to be content. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would. Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing to us about contentment. And I want to read it to you. Follow along with me, if you would. Maybe underline a few things. Philippians 4, verse 11 through 13. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content, underline this, I have learned, notice learn, it's a process. I have learned to be content in any circumstance. That'll preach right there. Are you content in any circumstance? Now he goes on from there, he breaks it down for us. I have experienced times of need and times of abundance. In any and every circumstance, I have learned, there's that learned again, why don't you underline this, I have learned the secret of contentment. Whether I go satisfied or hungry, have plenty or nothing, I am able to do all things through the one who strengthens me, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Now Paul is describing to us contentment, and he's saying it is a secret. 
I have learned a secret. A secret is something that not everyone knows. Has anyone ever told a secret and you've been on the outside of the secret and you just wanted to know what they were talking about? This summer we had the opportunity to go with my family up. Uh, we vacationed up in Tahoe and uh, we spent some days camping up there. And uh, the family, we all went out one night to a restaurant in town called Base Camp. And while we were waiting for our meal, had all the kids there and we're sitting around the table and my oldest, Colton, starts this game called Snaps. And, I, you know, he starts into this game and I don't have a clue as to what's going on. Uh, it's this game where you have to figure out the pattern of what's going on in order to give him the answer that he's looking for. And usually they're identifying, you know, movie stars and things like that. But it's, it's just the weirdest thing. I, didn't, I still don't know how it works. But anyway... He's doing all this and he's snapping his fingers and he's saying this stuff and they're all, and the kids are catching on and they're yelling out, Tom Hanks, and he's all, that's right. And I'm like, what? How do you, how, what? What are you talking about? And they kept doing this for a while and, and I started to get a little frustrated because everyone was in on the secret and the old man was on the outside looking in. And when I thought about this passage, I would think it's much like that. Paul is saying, hey, I've learned this secret. Now, not everybody in the body of Christ is going to get this one, but I'm going to share it with you. And this secret is going to change your life. And so, when it comes to your finances, here's where we're going to start. Write this in if you would. When it comes to your finances, if your yearnings exceed your earnings, you're going to be in trouble. If your yearnings exceed your earnings, you're going to be in trouble. Now for the young families and the young adults and the young people that we have here uh, this morning, I, I really want you to listen to me intently today. Because if you can get a hold of this stuff at a young age, you will live life much differently. The chorus of your life financially and everything else will be completely different than what the American ideal is. And if you can catch it young, your life will be forever changed. If you don't learn the secret of contentment, you're going to be in debt. If you don't learn how to be content, you'll never have enough money. I want you to know that most people don't have an income problem. They have a spending problem. Hello. You still love your pastor? Just chew on that one for a while. <laughs> Some things take a while to settle in. Time Magazine did an article on the subject and explained that for every $1,000 we make in America as consumers, $300 goes on credit for every 1000 I was listening to the radio the other day and I heard a stat on consumer debt. Consumer debt simply means the debt you and I all have accumulated in America and right now the consumer debt in America for all of us is $3.7 trillion. It's not rocket science to figure out why people are stressed out. Most people are in debt and just trying to keep their head above the water. Money Magazine did an article and reported, it reported on Orange County's medium income, median income. And their income in Orange County is 80% higher than the rest of the nation. Yet they also reported in every strata when they went back and asked the residents, so they make 80% more than the rest of us, and then they went back and surveyed them, and 
They said in their survey, this group of people, we just wish we had 20 to 40% more and then everything would be okay. Howard Hughes was a billionaire, lived quite a while ago, died many years ago. They asked him a question. I remember the interview. They said, how much does it take to make a man happy? And his answer is coming from a billionaire, just a little bit more. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 30, it's healthy to be content, but envy will eat you up. Now, King Solomon was the wisest and wealthiest man who ever lived, and we're going to go to him for some advice this morning. He has some great advice when it comes to money management. He wrote in Ecclesiastes 6, verse 9, and this sums up the whole message today. It is better to be satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting more. Do you remember in my opening message some weeks ago, I answered the question, why are we talking about finances during the holiday season? Because I want your stress level to go down and I want your faith level to go up. We are right in the heart of the season of discontent, otherwise known as the Christmas season, the shopping season. We all know it's true. There's more overspending during this time than any other time of year. We must understand that the entire American advertising system is to create two things in you. Discontent and desire. That's what they're after. That what you have isn't good enough. You need the newer model. Or just a desire to have more. And guess what? Over the next 35 days, it's on. They are trying to get you into their shops and stores any way that they possibly can. Now, we're going to look at five effective ways, uh, excuse me, five effects of always wanting more. Point number one, write it in. Five effects of always wanting more. Always wanting more will wear you out. The race to get more drives us to overwork. And overwork brings overload. People in America are worn out. They're tired. They call it the rat race for a reason. They're exhausted. People give up their health in order to get more. Listen to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4. Do not wear yourself out to become rich. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. Solomon is is saying it's foolish to wear yourself out uh, always trying to get more. Write this in if you would. Contentment is the antidote. Now I want to tell all of you today, this is not a message against wealth. We're talking about contentment. This isn't about wealth. God loves to bless people. This is about being content with what it is that God has given you. And the Bible is warning us that we need to live for what matters most. Point number two, write it in if you would, always wanting more will bring more expense. It costs me more to have more. I've heard it said, if the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, so is the water bill. Ecclesiastes 5.11. Now remember, this is written by the wealthiest man who ever lived. He says, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth? Except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers. Isn't that true? The more we have, the more ways we can find to spend it. There's a bumper sticker that's out there that says, I used to dream of the salary that I'm now starving on. Some of you will get that later. How many people get caught 
Or how many people got caught in the housing market? Remember what happened? Remember the bubble when that happened, what, 10 years ago or so? Remember what was happening? Banks were lending money and finding creative ways to give to people uh, loans that they couldn't afford. Everyone well knew it, but it was this desire. People weren't content. They wanted more. And then it finally happened. The bubble burst, and we all saw the results of it. The truth is that many of us want too much. A lot of the things are wants, not needs. What did God say? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He didn't say I will supply all your greeds. Number three, write it in, always wanting more will bring sleepless nights. The more you have, the more you have to worry about. Hey, if you don't have it, you don't have to worry about it. Right? Listen, a lot of people have come to realize the fewer things you own, the fewer things you have to repair, the fewer things you have to maintain, the fewer things you have to insure, the fewer things you have to pay taxes on. Read Ecclesiastes 5.12. It says this, now remember, it's the wealthiest man that ever walked the planet writing this. The sleep of the laborer is pleasant, but the wealth of the rich will not allow him to sleep. With having more can bring more worry. What what is he worrying about? How to invest, how to save, how to stay ahead how to maintain, how to avoid taxes. There's a study that shows insomnia increases with income. I think Solomon knew something about this. Number four, always wanting more will bring more conflict. Always wanting more increases my expenses, which creates more stress, which leads to more conflict. Look at me. The number one cause of divorce in America is what? It's over money. People are fighting about money in their households. They're stressed out. They're in debt. They're not doing well. Money isn't being managed well, and they are at each other, and marriages are falling apart. Look at Proverbs 15, 27. It says, greed brings grief to the whole family. 1 Timothy 6, 9. Those who long to be rich, however, stumble into temptation and a trap and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Listen to me, when, when, when greed and discontent take over in your life, when you are not content and, and you're just always out for more, you can, the Bible is saying you can fall prey to many things. You can fall prey to get rich quick schemes and take risks that you shouldn't take. People who are discontent are always looking for a way to make a fast buck. We all know the saying, if it's too good to be true, it is. How many times have we heard about the scandals in the news? Maybe you heard about a guy by the name of Bernie Madoff. Have you ever heard of him? Because old Bernie made off with about $3 billion of other people's money. Content people aren't going to be lured in. The Bible has much to say about this. It has much to say about how to gain financial independence, and we'll study this a little later, but let me just give it to you. It's not these quick, get-rich-quick things. The Bible says, little by little, you make it grow. Albert Einstein said, the single most powerful force in the universe is the power of compound interest. Number five, write it in. Always wanting more will bring more dissatisfaction. There are many, many people who think having more will make them happy. Having more will make them more secure. 
Having more will make them more important. And I want to say to you this morning, none of that is true. It doesn't last. The satisfaction is short-lived. It's here and it's gone. Take a look at the dissatisfaction of Hollywood. Look at the entertainment industry. Look at the sports industry. If they are the standard of all things with wealth and accumulation, look how dissatisfied they are. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. That's a great passage. Remember the guy that wrote this was the wealthiest man that ever lived. Mick Jagger, you know who that guy is? You believe that guy's still singing? I mean, he's still going. But he sings a song, I can't get no satisfaction, though I try and I try and I try and I try. The Bible says it's foolish to think wealth will bring happiness. And let's get honest this morning. How many of you in 2017 would like to live a life Less worn out, less stressed, with less conflict, with more satisfaction in your life. Raise your hand if that's you. So let's talk about how that can happen. Let's look at three things about contentment, living a life of contentment. What do I have to do to be content? Number one, write it in. Here it is. Stop comparing myself to others. Stop, 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 stop. Just in case you didn't hear me on the fifth row back there, stop. Think about that for a while. Stop. Stop comparing yourself to someone else. You are unique. I love what Dean says, you're an original, don't die a copy. You're not one in a million, you are one in 7.5 billion. God doesn't make clones. Even identical twins aren't identical. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2 says, For we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves. It is not wise, the Bible says, Don't do it. But the problem is, we do it. You walk into somebody's house, and you start. A comparison starts to happen. You look at the floor, the furniture, you look at this, you look at that. Ladies, you look at somebody else, what she's dressing, what she's got on, her hair, the clothes. I wish I had her life. I wish I had his job. I wish I had that car. We have to stop comparing ourselves. I heard about a couple who was in deep financial trouble. They went to a small group in their church, and this peop- the people's house they went to was really, really nice. When they left, the wife said to the husband, did you see that? Their furniture goes back to Louis the 14th. And he said, yeah, our- ours goes back to Ikea on the 15th. Here's a statement that's going to help you. Write this down if you would. Admire without having to acquire. The principle of contentment is learning to be satisfied with what you have. You need to also rejoice for others who are prosperous. Without being jealous or envious or feeling like you have to have what they have, just rejoice. Remember in in, in the parable of the talents, the bags of money? They weren't compared to one another. And we can rejoice for those who have much, who have been blessed. We can enjoy those things. We don't need to compare ourselves to others. In fact, the Bible says when we do, it is a sin. It's such a serious sin that God put it in with the Big Ten. It's in the Ten Commandments. Right there with don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. Exodus 20, 17 says, you shall not covet 
anything that belongs to your neighbor. You're not to look at your neighbor, your friend, your brother, your sister in Christ and say, man, why do they have that? I want that. What is coveting? We need to break this down for a minute. Coveting means, in the Hebrew, to pant after. In the Greek, it means to grab or to grasp so tightly that your hands are tight, so tight that you can't even let go. I was thinking about this when I was studying this idea of covet, and I had remembered in some of the programs that I watch about nature. I remember one in particular that talked about how they catch baboons and monkeys in Africa. And what they will do is they will put uh, some seeds or fruit in a pot and tie it to a stake or find a hole in the ground and put some seeds in it. And then the monkey that is so curious cannot resist. That guy's got to know what's in this hole. And so this guy will put the seeds down in and then he backs away. It's just a, just a hole in the side of a hill. And this baboon is so curious about what's in there, he cannot resist. So he goes up and he finds something good inside. He reaches in and grabs it. And he can't get away. Look at that. I mean, look at that guy. And then the guy comes, puts the noose around him, and monkey stew is served. No, I'm kidding. That's not what happened. I, let, I've seen this. No, no. Let, let me clarify. He takes this little guy. He has him lick salt for a long time, makes him sit there, and then he lets him go. The man was looking for water, lets the monkey go, and he's so thirsty, he runs to his secret watering hole, and the man finds water. Now that is pretty good. Has nothing to do with my sermon, but that's really a good thing. Back to this. Think about it. The monkey reaches in, grabs a hold, and won't let go. And the captor comes. All the monkey has to do is open its hand. And it will get away. It's created for itself its own trap. And that's exactly what we do. When we covet, when we outlive our means, when we don't live according to biblical standard, we reach into that hole, we grab onto something, and we will not let go. And then when we try to get away, the captor comes and destroys our family, destroys our relationships, destroys our health, all because we are unwilling to let go and do it God's way. That's what coveting will do to you. You see, desire in itself is not wrong. It's uncontrolled desire that will get you in trouble. You've ever heard the term impulse shopping? Right? It exists because of uncontrolled desire. Desires can be a wonderful thing if they are surrendered to the control of Jesus Christ. When you have a desire for heavenly things, when you have a desire for doing everything for God, when you're passionate and desirous to live for Him in every area of your life, you will be a mighty weapon in God's hands. The second key to contentment, write it in if you would, enjoy what I have. If I'm always focused on the next thing, I won't enjoy what I have. I've got to enjoy what I've got. This mentality makes us vulnerable to getting overextended. How many people buy a beautiful home that's beyond what they can afford, and now they're never there to enjoy it because they have to do everything 
to maintain paying for it. The toys and everything else that's a part that they can't enjoy. The backyard that nobody's swimming in. It's simpsity because everybody's out trying to keep this thing going. God wants us to enjoy what we have. You know how many families and marriages have fallen apart because someone is just trying to pay for all the bills and finally all of the balls can't be juggled any longer and the whole thing falls down. Yes, they have a house, but they don't have a home. God wants us to enjoy our lives. Now, now listen. Listen to what he said to the Israelites when they went into the promised land. I want you to understand that God wants you to enjoy life. Listen to what he said when they came in in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 through 10. Look, look at what it says. For the Lord your God is bringing you into the good land, flowing with streams and pools of water, with fountains and springs that gush out of the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig fig trees and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. God blessed his people. He wanted them to enjoy their life. Some people believe that that we've been put here just to kind of endure and make it through. and, And that's not true. God created everything for our enjoyment. Listen to 1 Timothy 6 verse 17. God who richly provides with all things for our enjoyment. Think about what God has given us. God gave us eardrums so we could enjoy music. He gave us skin so we could feel. He gave us taste buds so we can enjoy food. He gave us a nose to smell. He gave us eyes so we could see in color. He could have made everything black and white if he wanted to, but he didn't. The fact is, God enjoys watching you enjoy what he created for you. God enjoys watching you enjoy the, the blessings that he brings into your life. Isn't that true, parents? Don't we enjoy, when when we do something for our kids, don't we get more enjoyment out of just watching them love whatever it is? And, and enjoying life. When I was at the wedding last night, just sitting there and basking in this whole thing that's happening with my son, to sit back as a proud dad and just go, man, this is just awesome. My enjoyment was watching his happiness. I also want to say when you travel around the world, you learn to appreciate little things. Things like hot water and ice cubes and clear water to drink and nice roads and heat and air and a vehicle and a place to live and your health. Here's what I want you to get. We need to pause and look around and say, thank you, God, for what you've given me. Listen, next week is going to be Thanksgiving. And folks, no matter what we have, We are a blessed people. God has been good to all of us. We need to enjoy what we have. I remember something my wife used to do with our kids. You know, this this idea of not being content, it starts when kids are very young. Idea of kids being selfish. Have you noticed? You don't have to teach them to be selfish. My kids, we would give them toys when they were little and, and they'd be really excited about those toys for about seven days and then they're no longer excited about it. And then it would just be in the room and in the toy box and they wanted something more. Now I want something else. And you know, this is how you accumulate all these toys in the house. They're everywhere. So my wife would give the boys something and, and then after they wouldn't play with it anymore. They didn't appreciate it anymore. So what she would do is find those toys that they didn't appreciate any longer. She would grab them and she would go hide them 
up high somewhere. Six months later, she would wrap those toys up and give them back to the boys again. And they were all excited about these toys. This is a great little system we had going. But there's something about that. We tend to play with something, get it, it lasts for a while, right? And then it just doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't satisfy any longer. God wants us to enjoy what we have. If you learn to be grateful for all the things you do have, and you're grateful for the little things that don't cost money, you will discover what Paul discovered, and that is contentment. And lastly, as we wrap this up, remember, here it is, write it in if you would, life is not about things. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed because your true life is not made up of the things you own, no matter how rich you may be. There's a saying, never judge your self-worth by your net worth. Contentment comes from having a proper perspective. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. For we fix our attention. That means we, we fix our gaze. We put our focus not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For what can be seen lasts only for a time. What cannot be seen lasts forever. The Bible is telling us true happiness is found in relationships. The world says more, 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 more. And the Bible says it's not in more. Look around. Pause for a moment. And just remember the family you have around you. The people you have around you. Pause for a moment. You are blessed. You're blessed. As I wrap up this morning, I want to talk about Johnny Deary and his wife Chantel. Johnny and his wife ended up coming to our church through the About Kids First Day program. They've been coming here ever since. They've given their hearts to the Lord. Johnny's raising a young family. And Johnny um, and I get together fairly often. And he shared with me his background. And he came from a very dysfunctional home life. And so we sit around and we talk about uh, different things. I feel like I'm able to be a mentor in his life. And he just moved from one place to another. And he's just kind of scraping to get by. Enough money to pay the bills and take care of the kids. And, and we're sitting around talking. And I said, Johnny, listen, man, I know the background you came from. And I know it was rough. But I said, Johnny, here is the amazing thing about the Lord. It's all starting with you and Chantel. Your lives have been radically transformed. And I said, Johnny, here's the deal. If you will just begin to pour into your children now, I want you to imagine, Johnny, years from now, when you are older, you're going to be sitting around a table someday, and your kids are going to be there with their spouses, and the grandkids, and the great-grandkids, and they're all going to be there, and you're going to look up, and you're going to see your inheritance and your reward. You're going to look at those kids and say, thank you, God, you changed the chorus of my life. We were talking about what true riches really were. He went home, and we came back a week later, and he said, Pastor, I had a dream. He said, I had a dream about what we were talking about. He said, I saw myself. I think I was around 80 years old, and I was at that table. And he said, Pastor, they were all there. And I was just feeling such pride in my heart at what the Lord had done. And then he said, Pastor, in my dream, I looked over at my great-grandson, and I asked him if he would pray for the meal. And he said, joy just filled my heart. And I said, Johnny, it is all starting right now. The seeds you sow today, you sow in one season. You reap a harvest in another season. Johnny, don't worry about the money. Don't worry about those things. Just love on those kids. Point them to Jesus. Love on one another. And someday the vision you have, it is going to come true. You're going to be at that table. And great will be your reward. So folks, the Bible has a lot to say 
about managing money, but true wealth is in learning to be content with what you have. And so today, as we wrap this whole thing up, let me just say, always wanting more will wear you out. Always wanting more will bring more expenses. Always wanting more will bring sleepless nights. Always wanting more will bring more conflict. Always wanting more will bring dissatisfaction. Three keys for you. Stop comparing yourself to others. Enjoy what you have. Life is not about things. 